How long were you taking courses before you decided to make the jump? It was about a year because it's, I had a full-time job. So like doing that, it's, <laughs> you would work like 40 hours a week and then like doing more stuff after work, like is hard. All of 2019, it's, I started to apply for jobs and I had an interview like lined up the second week of March in 2020. And we all know what happened there. Oh, your indie projects, how do you make the trade-offs between writing clean code and speed? It depends on what I want out of the project. What's up? Welcome to another episode of the iOS Dev Podcast. In this episode, we had Michaela Karen on the show. Michaela is an iOS and indie developer. She's also a content creator and one of the organizers of the iOS Dev Happy Hour. I hope you guys enjoy. I saw one of your tweets recently about login versus sign in and which way have you decided or are you still on the fence? Okay, so I'm still deciding. It was really funny. I sent that tweet out. It was at like one o'clock in the morning, my time. That's what I was thinking about was, yeah. oh, do I use <laughs> login or do I use sign in? Those were my thoughts at 1 a.m. Uh, I yeah. was basically, I'm making a tutorial video that'll maybe be out soon by the time this podcast is out. So if you see a video from me, that's probably then going to be the video I'm talking about in this because I don't want to say what it is exactly. But, you know, if it's the one video that has come out within the next couple of weeks, it'll be that. Uh, basically, it's I need to implement some kind of authentication for this video. So I was like, OK, do I do login or do I write login or do I write sign in or is it like sign up? So, so like sign up for an account or do you register for an account? So I was like, wait, which yeah. one do we use? Is like, is there a preference because you see it all over the web, but like you see it both ways. Uh, so I was trying to think of yeah. which one do I use? And I still haven't decided. It is linked on the tweet and on the Mastodon post because I, you know, there's so many social medias now. I had to post it like on four of them. Um, it's I <laughs> linked it, I think on Twitter and Mastodon at least. Um, there is Apple documentation on whether they use login or whether they use sign in and kind of the reason behind each of them. But then I also was pointing, somebody else pointed out to me too, though, they also break their own rules with that. So it's kind of still <laughs> up in the air, but I'm thinking of using the word sign in because it's called sign in with Apple. So sign in would make sense yeah. for like signing in to an account, but then they say log in with like your computer, you're logging into your computer. So it's like, I don't know. I don't know the difference because both, both ways you're putting in a password and you're authenticating yourself. So I'm not sure yeah. if there's really a big difference between which one you end up using, but I'll probably end up using sign in and then maybe log out. I don't know, but I, I think sign out makes sense, but I was told by a lot of people. So like, I'm still like very up in the air about either one, but it's, I was told by a lot of people that um, for non-native English speakers, they find, uh, they find that sign in and sign out is confusing because it is so close as opposed to, they don't have that same issue kind of oh, with really? log in, oh. log out. But I'm also like, either way, though, it's if you have the word sign in, sign out and log in, log out, the difference is still the yeah. same amount of words. The word in and out is still the difference yeah. between both of those. <laughs> so I don't know if it's just a general linguistic kind of thing, but it's that's what I found is more people do like the login kind of. But it depends. It depended on the audience because yeah. the opposite poll won on Twitter versus Mastodon. So like we couldn't come to a oh, decision, really? and it was really close. Like it was login <laughs> on one of them, and it was sign out, sign in on the other. So it's like yeah. it's kind of just pick whichever you want. <laughs> yeah, I but wonder that was, if like, it a was very uh, long story. <laughs> I wonder if it's based on people's location. Like if your audience is more international on Twitter, if if they prefer Ooh, login, good point. log out. Yes, because I, I forgot about that, that, yeah, I have way less followers on Mastodon than I do on Twitter. So, like, it's true that there's more people that answered the poll, I think, on Twitter than answered it on Mastodon. But, yeah, I didn't think about geographically the audience that are for each of those audiences. It probably is yeah. more international on Twitter because I've had the platform longer, basically, because I only had Mastodon since, like, November of last year, I think, is when everything started exploding. Um, so, yeah, yeah it's... <laughs> It's probably, it's a little bit of both, but it's funny that like the opposite one, opposite like choice one on yeah. each platform. So it's like, there's still no decision. Like everybody didn't yeah. decide one or the other. It's, we are still, nobody knows. <laughs> I remember going through a project, like one of my, in my early days of learning, I had a project where I started off with login, login view controller. Mm -hmm. And then like halfway through, I switched to sign in and I still yep. had it called login view controller. And I had to like, rewrite everything to make to make it like match up 
<laughs> yes, so then definitely it means you the can... rule of thumb is whichever one you pick, make sure you use it throughout your whole code base. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know. Uh, for the record, I prefer sign in and sign out. <laughs> that's what I go with now. That's your vote? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's my vote. Moving forward, though, I saw that you used to work at a steel company. Is that correct? Or... Yes. Yeah, you did your research. Then, if you, if you found that, it's like <laughs> I know where you found it too, because there's only it's only actually mentioned yeah. in one place. Uh, but yeah, I used to actually work in manufacturing before I ended up switching to iOS development. So when I was in college, I went to Purdue University, which is in Indiana, and um, I studied like mechanical and electrical engineering, which is fun and all, and I do like it. Uh, and it's, I did that, but then I also got a minor like in programming. So in, it was called computer information technology, which basically just meant it's programming. Um, but it wasn't iOS dev. It was just kind of general like C sharp Java kind of stuff. Uh, so with that, it's you put, if you put mechanical, electrical and programming, if you put all of those together, that is automation. So like manufacturing automation, like automating anything, any kind of product uh, that you're like building. So it's all like manufacturing. So then that's how I ended up getting into manufacturing, like right out of college. And all of that I do still think is fun and interesting, but it's I liked the programming aspect of it way, way, way more than I liked mechanical and electrical. Because like electrical, I don't care how many like what the current is of something going through like your computer. I don't care about the volts or amps and all sorts of stuff like V equals IR. That's like an equation that anybody who's ever done any kind of electrical stuff, uh, volts equals amps times resistance. That's like the only thing anybody remembers uh, if they like did electrical, but then like don't anymore. But it's like, I don't care about that as much. I'm just like, okay, cool. I know there's a lot of engineering behind this. I just need it to work. And then I can do something with it. So then that's when you actually do programming and make something happen, basically. So yeah, it's and I liked programming way more. So what more. got you into it? What got you into it originally then? Was it like you trying to do like cool things with electricity and uh what did I do? I think it was what is it, in high school I was thinking about somebody was like or what is it like you nobody knows what they want to do basically when they're in high school you kind of just sometimes go to college and don't really know what you're doing you know besides going into debt um so yeah. <laughs> I, was, yeah. I was like i was good at math so somebody was like oh you should do engineering and i was like okay well i like math enough might as well so from there i went to college in like mechanical engineering uh technology which is technically slightly different than mechanical engineering how purdue defines it um but it's i went into basically mechanical engineering and then i like that mechanical engineering is the broadest field of en engineering because like mechanical is like you know forces and like how somewhat how stuff is built and that's like in everything so it's the broadest field you could work in every industry but I started that and then I had to take one programming class like when I was a freshman, like my first year. So then I was like, oh, wow, this is super like I learned programming on YouTube before I actually ended up taking the class because it sounded so interesting to me and like literally took that one class, got an A plus because literally I actually like loved it. And then uh, I was like, wow, I really like this. Maybe I should change my major. So then that's when I went to my guidance counselor and then I ended up switching my major a little bit into um, something that still did mechanical electric but then did a little bit more programming. Um, so I did that and then ended up finishing my degree because by the time I actually, actually realized, wow, I do really, really, really like programming. I was already a junior, like in my third year. So I'm like, no, we're not switching my major. I'm not staying here longer than four years. We're not going into even more debt. I'll just, it's an America problem, but I'm like, okay, I'll just like be here for yeah. four years, get my degree, get it, get my, I did it paper. And then I moved out, uh, not moved out, but like graduated. And then finally um, I was like, oh yeah, I still really do like programming. And then that's how I ended up switching. And, and at the steel company, what was like a day to day like? Ooh, I, uh, so when I was in uh, manufacturing at the steel company, cause it's basically, it's a um, steel manufacturing. So we were melting down steel and making it into sheet metal. So it's like very, were very you big down things. Any steel? <laughs> I wasn't Did you melt any steel? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I did it personally because you have to, to melt steel, it has to actually be very, very hot. Like, it's one of those things you don't really think about. Um, but like, yeah, it's we were melting down scrap steel, making it into sheet metal. You melt it at like over 3000 degrees Fahrenheit. I have no idea what it is in Celsius. Um, but it's you melt it down in 
at like 3000 degrees by the time it's actually still rolling into like a big coil basically that is um like 1300 degrees fahrenheit still it doesn't actually fully cool down for like a whole day or something like that um <laughs> Yeah, so that was like the process of what we were doing. And what I actually was doing was managing their uh, software system. So like their automation system. So that means I had to know what it does. So it's all, it's automation. It's happening all automatically. Uh, it all for the most part just works. If it doesn't work, that's where my job comes in and starts figuring out, okay, why did something happen that shouldn't have happened? And to be able to do that, that means you have to understand what it's supposed to do. And then also be able to understand and read all the different logs of like what could have gone wrong for some specific reason. That's what like made it uh, mess up basically. Uh, so like day to day with like, you see like it runs 24 seven, like it is automation. So it's all kind of just like happening. Um, and then it's like after something has been made, that's when we can then do the evaluation of, oh, this specific one, something went wrong, figuring out what happened. But also you have what are called um, a metallurgist, which those are the people that study metal, like actually um, the chemical, mm -hmm. not chemical, but yeah, probably chemical and like physical structure of metal. Um, and they can then determine, okay, based on some of the data I have, based on other data from samples that have been taken, they can figure out, okay, maybe this specific product got messed up a little bit, but can we still sell it? Does it still fit within the parameters of whatever the customer wanted that like it can still work? Sometimes it can, sometimes it can't. If it can't, uh, that's unfortunate. We, we still find something to do with it, but it's like my day-to-day -day was for the most part figuring out why something may have messed up. And then also like, so it's kind of like reading a lot more logs and stuff like that. <laughs> Dang, what technology was were they using for the like what languages and stuff like that? Oh goodness. Here's the thing also about manufacturing, uh, and why I left is there is a lot of old technology. It could have been where I was, so I'm not gonna say super general, but overall kind of general. They have very old technology. So um this one wasn't awful, meaning like it was when was I doing this? It was 2018 to like almost through 2020, basically, uh, we were working on a computer that was set up for like Windows Server, like 2012. So it's like eight years old at that point. Um, and it was new only a couple years prior to that, which actually isn't that awful, but it's still kind of a little bit farther behind. But it's a lot of hardware is there because it works and it hasn't been changed because it works. So yeah. <laughs> Ours wasn't too bad. So it was actually, for the most part, it was built, built off of C-sharp. Um, but then also there's other, other parts of it that were running off of Fortran, which is from like wow. <laughs> the seventies, the nineties. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, I had, I've had to read it. I have thankfully never had to write that code, but I have had to read parts of it. Um, but yeah, it's, that's one of the things of personally why I wanted to leave was because I didn't want to work with older technology as much anymore. Yeah. And how did you, um, how did you decide to leave and did you go with iOS development in mind when you left or were you thinking other, other routes? Uh, I was going with iOS development. I had taken one course when I was in college. It was kind of like a self-study. So like I bought a Udemy course and I was allowed to use that for like a semester. Basically the professor just had to like approve everything that I did, which was super cool. So basically I just had to take a Udemy wow. course um, and that counted as a college class, college class. But with that, it's, I took this U Udemy course that was iOS development. I want to say it was iOS 11 or so. This was like 2017. That sounds about right. Yeah. Um, and so I took that course and it was a lot of fun. And then I liked iOS development, but I never got back into it basically. So then after um, I was at my manufacturing job, I was like, oh, well, I did iOS development once. That kind of still seems fun to do. So then that's when I very purposefully started learning iOS development and Swift and everything right after um, like after work and everything. It's I would just like learn iOS development, take different courses. Mm -hmm. For the most part, I took free courses uh, and then I had like a couple paid ones sprinkled in. What, what year was this Were you when you were taking these courses? It was 2019. Yeah, it was 2019. And you, you already had in your back of your mind that you wanted to become an iOS developer. Mm -hmm. Yep. So how long, how long were you taking courses before you decided to make the jump? Did you like start applying or? 
It was about a year because it's, I had a full-time job. So like doing that, it's, <laughs> you would work like 40 hours a week and then like doing more stuff after work, like is hard, but, um, I would learn iOS development after work in t all of 2019. It's like I started to apply for jobs and I had an interview like lined up the second week of March in 2020. And we all know what happened there. Oh. <laughs> so it's, it delayed everything. So like really it's, I took courses for about a year before I started applying, but because the pandemic like hit full force, everybody stopped hiring for that whole like summer of 2020. Uh, so I was just like, okay, well, looks like I can't get an iOS dev job right now along with the rest of the world. So it's, I just kept learning at that point and then it was it was kind of like three or so months in so when, when it was like july august you know that's when we all started figuring out okay this isn't just like immediately going away so i was like okay well i might as well then just keep applying so then that's what i started to do and then i didn't actually end up landing my job until the end of 2020 and then i started my first ios dev job at the very beginning of 2021 what were the challenges during that process of applying and and working I... a full-time job right <laughs> Yeah, it's hard to schedule interviews when you have a full-time job because like you either have to be that person who's <laughs> scheduling true. an interview at like after 5 p.m. for like uh like nobody wants to work after 5 p.m. but like you have to be that person who has to schedule an interview or you either like kind of take off or like I've even I've seen people who have done like interviews um during their day job because like I was in an office so it wasn't like work from home you can kind of just you know take a call real quick and nobody kind of knows, but it's, I was physically in an office. So like, I couldn't really do that. Uh, but it was scheduling interviews is really hard when you have a full-time job. It's nice though. If you apply, I'm on Eastern time. If you have, if you apply to a company that's in California, they are on Pacific time. So when it is actually 5 PM, my time, it is only like 2 PM their time. So it's not the end of the workday for them. So then that kind of works out as opposed to when you apply to any company, then on the East coast, then we're all in the same time zone. And yeah, I'm that person who's being like, can you do a meeting on like 5 PM on Friday? And nobody wants to say yes to that, including <laughs> me though. But it's like, that's like the only time I really had available. Uh, so that's like tough, but then. One of my friends told me when I was applying, and this is really what I like n try to tell other people too, is really it's all a process and it's kind of a game. You just have to know how to play the game. So when you send out like 50 applications and actually hear nothing back from any of those people, 50 people have decided purely based on your resume, they don't want to invite you for an interview. So what that means is you need to change your resume because that's the only thing people have seen from you is your resume. But 50 people have now seen it and all agree they don't want to hire you for various different reasons. So now you need to change your resume. So I was sending out like multiple different versions of my resume all the time. Uh, and one like kind of hack too, which some hiring managers will kind of notice it here and there is, uh, and I was, I think told this or somebody told it to me, but it's, I did it here and there, depending on what company is, is you, when you're creating your resume and this is purely based like for USA, kind of audience because you know that's the country that i live in and that's like the stuff that i know so i don't know how this would go with like international but it's when you're running your resume look if you if it's a job that you really want look at their company's website and look at their values because they use specific keywords in their values they'll be like you know leadership inspiration like passion those kind of words they use like these are our values this is like how our company is based off of so you use those words in your resume so when you're describing something, you use one of those keywords and people will pick that out because they're like, oh, they may have looked at this because you can kind of tell if a resume is like very purely generic or if it's really kind of tailored to a company. And I only did that a little bit here and there with very like specific companies I wanted to work for, but it's because you're not going to do that for every single one. Like if you send out 10, like 10 job applications <laughs> in a day, you're not changing everyone. But if it is like one company you really want to work for, Sometimes you should put in a little bit extra effort on making your resume, like, I don't know, very tailored and using those kind of keywords, like hiring managers will pick up on that because sometimes hiring managers are not, um, what is it? Uh, they don't like know all the engineering aspects. They only know like, uh, keywords here and there. So if you use keywords of like values of the company, but then also use specific keywords of what may have been on the job posting itself, then you're more like, more likely to get a second look at your resume because whatever applicant tracking processing system that they're using, they're, they're filtering four keywords. That's like kind of the whole point. Cause yes, we have AI now and everything, and that's like doing whatever, yeah. but it's people are still reading your resume and trying to determine based off that, do they want to interview you? So it's really, can you write a good resume is like the first step of looking for a job. Yeah. And, 
And speaking of AI, I think some companies are even using like AI software to filter out resumes. Mm-hmm. For like the companies that get thousands of applications. Yeah, which so using the values might be helpful. Mhm. And it's AI it can be, be useful helpful. for those things, but it also AI for everything is it's all based on whatever model it's trained off of. So it's if it's trained off of a model that's very biased to something specific, then that can end up hurting applicants because they don't fit whatever model that they're looking for based on words versus a personal conversation with somebody. How did you end up actually getting the the role? I how did I get that role? <laughs> I haven't thought about this in so long. It's funny. Um, I got that role because actually somebody, I told somebody I was looking for a job. So it's because I had a full-time job at the time, I didn't want to put that big open for work uh, banner on my LinkedIn profile because then <laughs> my current employer would see that. And I would be like, I don't want them knowing very like explicitly that I'm looking to leave them. So I never turned on that like open for work thing. I think you can turn it on specifically for employers. Uh, so I, I think I did that towards the end when I was actually like, I really, really, really want to leave. Um, so it's, I think I did that very towards the end, but it's, I had told like one other person that I was looking for a job. And then he ended up throwing me into a group of people he knows who like are all in the tech industry. And one person from that happened to be somebody that I had interviewed with at a different company. That person was now at a separate company. So I ended up uh, applying for that job um, at this other company that that person had. So it was somewhat of a mutual connection of possibly how I either got the first interview or it was my resume was good enough. They decided to interview me basically, but it's that's sort of how I ended up finding out about that company and how I ended up like working for them. So that was like my first job, which was somewhat reference kind of based but somewhat also luck yeah. basically uh but then it was funny like the second job and the current job that i work at now i actually found that one on social media which i think is cool <laughs> yeah that's been a reoccurring thing um throughout through through these episodes like being active the, being active in the community is really helpful yes uh, I... not just your personal brand but like even maybe even getting a job yeah, definitely. Because people are like, people or and somebody are, has asked me too, it's like, where do you find jobs to apply for? And it's like, okay, you, you can look at LinkedIn, you can look at like Dice or like hiring kind of companies. But it's also people are on Twitter mainly, because uh, it is still a big platform, no matter like your opinions on social media, it's still a pretty big platform, even if it's also a dumpster fire, but it's still there. So people are like posting a job application being like, hey, I work for this company. We are looking for somebody. Here's the link to the application. DM me if you apply to it. And it's just like, there's nothing wrong with telling somebody you applied to that job because like you now have one person who knows your application is there versus not having like any reference. Cause like when you apply to a job online, just blindly, nobody like knows that you kind of applied. It's just in some, some system somewhere that you were there. But if you actually end up DMing somebody and telling them, hey, I applied to this shop, I'm really interested because of X, Y, Z reason, I saw your post, like that makes it so that you have one extra touch point of somebody new that you applied to this job. And I had it like on Twitter too, where it was a job at Apple and uh, I had said, oh, here, here's this job application. Somebody was like, hey, apply to this job. Let me know, like DM me. And I was like, I looked at the job posting. It said, you should know Objective C. And I didn't at the time. Um, and I actually, I still don't know Objective-C, so I still actually don't know it, but it's somebody was like, okay, hey, apply to this job. I looked at the description, it said no Objective-C. I commented on it saying, hey, I would like to apply to this, but I don't know Objective-C like at all. And the guy was like, oh no, it's okay. Like still go ahead and apply. So I did. And because of that, it's, he gave my resume to somebody specific, I'm guessing, and was like, oh yeah, this person is applying. And then I got an interview purely based on telling somebody, hey, I applied for this job. And like, if I had just blindly applied to that, I probably wouldn't have then gotten a, uh, gotten an interview just because nobody knew I would have applied to that job except for their, like whatever tracking system that they use. So because somebody else was able to tell somebody, Hey, you applied to this job. That's what really got it. So that like, I had an interview, I didn't get past the first interview, but I had the interview. (laughs) Yeah. It's a shot that counts, you know? (laughs) Yeah, it's all about, like, figuring out how you want to apply to jobs. And also, like, there is, like, quantity over quality in some points, but then other points, it's depending on just whatever it is. It's you can do way more quality versus quantity of what you're doing. 
but it's all a game of figuring out every single step of the process. So it's like, you have the resume. Do you have a good resume? Can you pass the first interview? Can you pass a technical interview? Can you do whatever else there is after that? But it's all, they're all like broken into steps for a reason. Cause they're trying to find out diff like from a hiring perspective, they're trying to find out different things about you. So when you know what that process is and know like how to approach it, then you have a better idea of how to actually get through and how to get through like the whole interview process. Changing gears. Um, how many Swift conferences have you attended? Ooh, that's a good question. Uh, how many conferences have I attended? Oh man. Uh, I went, my very first conference was 360 IDEV in Denver last year. Then was that the first one that I know that was the first one. I'm trying to think what the second one is. I think the second one was server side Swift in London. Then I went to iOS conf SG in Singapore and then. <laughs> So these are all different countries too. Like <laughs> my first three was yeah. like, oh, let me just go to a different country for every single one. Uh, that was three, and then Deep Dish Swift was in Chicago, so that was four. So I think I've been to a total of four conference conferences, not counting online conferences. If you count online, you'll have to throw like three more in there. But um, purely like in person conferences, I've been to like four, <laughs> and I spoke at all uh, of them. What's the? Too. <laughs> yeah. Oh. And what's the, what's the, what would you say is the best part of attending a conference? Uh, the best part definitely of attending a conference is just meeting other developers because it's all like what we've been talking about. It's all about networking. So really, can you, um, just talking to other developers, you never know what'll end up happening. Like you meet one person at a conference, you end up meeting them at a second conference, or, um, you end up following them on social media and then they have a job posting and then you end up getting that job. Like that's something that actually can totally happen just because you ended up meeting somebody and just like knowing their name, knowing who they are. Uh, but that's definitely the best part for me is meeting people. It's like, yeah, it's cool to learn more about iOS development. That's kind of the point of the conference, but also I yeah. am extroverted if people can't tell. And it's just like getting to meet <laughs> and talk to other people, I think is just so much fun because like with podcasting, like you're talking, interviewing other developers, everybody has an interesting story of how they ended up getting here. Um, or how they ended up leaving or something, but it's, everybody has some interesting story and it's just fun to meet and like meet and know how different people got to different places. So you, you've talked, you've given talks at four. So what advice would you give to someone who's giving their first talk? Ooh, advice to somebody who's giving their first talk is definitely just like, don't worry that it's not going to be like Paul Hudson's talks. Don't worry that it's not going to be like somebody who's been doing <laughs> conference talks for like 10 years because it doesn't make sense. Like. You're doing your first conference talk. Of course, it's not going to be at the quality of somebody who's been doing this for years and years and years. Like I haven't been doing this for years. I've been doing this actually for less than one year. And it's like, you can have, you can do like a good first talk and that's all like you need to kind of get in the door and figure out how it all works. So it's like, don't compare yourself to others, especially when you're comparing yourself to somebody who's been doing it for a long time, because in reality, that doesn't make sense. It's like a one-year-old try to compare their compare themselves to a teenager and wondering why they can't do something. They have years of experience. It actually, it doesn't make any sense. So it's like, don't compare yourself in that way. If, if you want to compare yourself, it's like the classic advice of compare yourself to yourself. Like how was your first talk? What would you do for your yeah. next talk? Yes, you can do that. Some people even say, don't do that, but it's like, or just like, don't compare yourself and just learn tips on how to do something and do your best for doing that. Like, it's very rare. You're actually going to get somebody who says like, I hated your talk. Oh, that was dumb. Like, you're not really <laughs> going to get stuff like that. You may get advice of, oh, you didn't explain this concept very well. And it's like, oh yeah, I know I didn't explain that concept because I was kind of nervous when I was saying it. So I kind of like skipped over a couple points that I had planned on saying. You may get like feedback like that, which is useful. But so then it makes you think of, okay, if I were to do this talk again, how would I do it and explain it differently? But like, you're not going to really ever get somebody who's just going to say like, your talk was trash. Yeah. So like, yeah. don't worry about that kind of thing. Like if you do, like, I'm sorry, that's very unfortunate, but it's also like, yeah. <laughs> why does that one person's voice matter compared to a lot of others who said your talk was good? True. That's really good advice. And what about uh, people who haven't given a talk yet, but they, they, they kind of want to. Some people, it's finding a topic to talk about. So that's like also where I'm at too. It's I kind of want to give another conference talk, but I also have no idea what to talk about. So like if you're looking to give your first one, kind of pick out like what would be a topic that sounds interesting, but also um, what's something that you can say about a topic that like people may not talk about. So like right now, um, what's hot is like 
core data and Swift data or something. If you do like a lot of research on how that works and what the differences are, that could be a conference talk. So like if somebody wants to give one, hey, there's an idea is give a conference talk <laughs> on that because it's a new technology, but then also it's um, how can you explain something differently than somebody else? Because like there's all knowledge that we all have. Like we all know the like similar process slash like the exact same topics. We all know what Swift is. We all like will start learning UI kit, Swift UI, like that kind of stuff. We like as an iOS developer, that's what we all know. But like if uh if it's like YouTube videos and stuff, it's everybody like is doing uh, videos and podcasts all about the same thing. We're literally all talking about the exact same topic, but why do you follow one versus the other is because you like how one person explains something versus somebody else. So like, if you're looking to give a conference talk, it's 100% totally fine to give a conference talk on something that somebody else has already done. You just have to decide how you wanna explain it differently than somebody else, or even even if you take inspiration from somebody's talks and, and like explain it in a certain way, like a specific I don't know theory on how something works, you explain it in the same way. You can then explain something, but then also say, okay, I interpreted it as this too, because like that's how you that's how everybody learns something. It's like we're all learning the same topics, but like some people may be able to learn directly from the Apple like WWDC videos, other people may not, and they instead like how somebody else explains that same topic. Like it's, you can talk about any, like anything really. Um, and, and it doesn't have to be technical, but it's how you explain things is really what people come from, like for conference talks and really for like any kind of learning material. You just like how somebody else explains something. Now I want to transition into, um, iOS dev happy hour. Cause the, the backstory to it is pretty interesting. So do you know the, the story? Yes. So I was there for the backstory for a really long time, for like almost a year. I was able to say I went to every single iOS dev happy hour, except for the first one, because it, I, um, the first, so how it all started, iOS dev happy hour, for those who don't know, is a monthly online uh, meetup for iOS developers. Like the URL is iosdevhappyhour.com. So you can go to that. You can see when our next meeting is. We announce it like monthly. Uh, I'm saying we as in, because I'm now an organi organizer of this, but how it all started was Alan uh, Weary, the guy who started it, he put out a tweet saying, hey, so do you want to just like chit chat about iOS dev with some other people? And a bunch of people responded. So like the first meeting had like 70 people and or 50 to 70, something like that. Um, like a good amount, more than like 10. So um, everybody like got together and just was on a Zoom call basically. And uh I missed the first one because I remember it happening, but as I fell asleep before it actually happened. So like I took a nap basically and missed the meeting. Um, but then afterwards on Twitter, I saw that like it became a thing and a lot of people were talking about it and how they really liked it. So I was like, oh man, I'm sad I missed the first one. So when he put out another one a month later, I was like, okay, okay, great. Like I'm going to make sure I don't miss this one because like everybody looked like they had a really good time. So I don't want to miss this meeting again. Um, and then from there, it basically became a monthly online meetup. Uh, Alan ended up making like an Eventbrite link. So it's completely free for anybody to attend. You just have to like sign up on Eventbrite and then you get the link, the Zoom link to the meeting. And that's what they've done ever since. But then with that, it's, I really liked how it ended up turning into, um, sharing people's stories. So when you join this meeting, you we have set up speakers who are just talking about how they got into iOS development. And a lot of the time, a lot of these people are like not doing um, traditional, I went to college, got a CS degree, got a developer job. Because like great for people to do that, but it's also like very cookie cutter. Like a lot of people do that. And that's totally fine. A lot of people do it though, but it's the same for all of them. But there's also a whole realm of so many developers who that's not their story. Some people's story is somebody ended up showing them a computer and showing them code, and then they ended up liking it and got a job. Like being iOSF happy hour, uh, I really like all the stories and just hearing how different people got into iOS development because this industry and all of programming, it's so interesting and cool that it's an industry where anybody can do it. You just have to learn how to code. That's like the whole thing is you just have to learn how to code. Like it's easy, yeah. not really, but it's like, that's the one step that you have to do. You have to learn how to code. You can get a job. That's exactly like a lot of people have done it and that's possible. Doing that itself is very hard, like of course, but that's, that is all you have to do is just learn to code. You can get a job. 
unlike different industries that you have to go to school for like 10 years, go like $100,000 in debt, and then you can get a job if you're lucky. Like, it's not like that. You can just like, you can fully do this like completely for free and get a job. And that's amazing. And because of that, it opens so many opportunities for different people to get into software development. But that's what I really like about iOS Dev Happy Hour is that we just are explain or like showing others how they got their first developer job because it is like getting that first job is the hardest one. It's like, because you have no industry contacts, like you don't talk to other like developers, the first like job is the hardest for that. And because of that, with iOS Dev Happy Hour, you're joining a monthly online meetup of iOS developers and you get to talk to them too. So it's like not just a presentation, you hear people's stories, but then we do breakout rooms where you can talk to others. And that's where you end up meeting somebody um, I met somebody at the time who had worked for Reddit. They have now since moved to work for Apple. This is like over the course of like a year and a half or so. And then like soon after that, or several months after that, we ended up meeting like in New York City and we had lunch together. So it's like, I met this person originally on iOS Dev Happy Hour before I was even an organizer. And then like we ended up talking, ended up finding they moved to a different company. And then like, then we eventually like ended up having lunch at some point in like a city I don't even live in, in New York City. So it's like, um, I was just like passing through actually. So like those kind of uh, connections that you make purely a Zoom meeting. So like you can meet so many different people from like all around the world. And that's, what's really cool too. How did you uh, become an organizer? Uh, I became an organizer because I knew Alan off of Twitter already. So like I was attending all the meetings anyways, because he ended up making like a small team of people who all started um, like once it was past like just him he was like okay wow this is actually a lot of stuff and it was becoming more popular at the time too um he like brought on a couple of the friends that he had at the time or still has but like i mean at the time then um he brought on like friends yeah. and they like helped with everything then it's because i was like attending the meetings constantly and i was also telling alan i was like hey if you ever need help let me know like i'll, I'll like help you with organizing and everything that was like i think several months or so from there later it's that's when i officially ended up me and chris Wu. Uh, who's also one of the organizers right now, we, I believe, joined at the same time. And I think that was last year or longer. I don't actually remember. Um, but it's we had both joined at the same time um, to like help all the organizing. And now right, uh, it's me, Chris Wu, Alex Silver, Frank Foster, and Adrian Eves. So what is that? Like five of us right now. Um, and yeah, it's it's basically joining from being like, hey, I love this thing. It's great. If you need help, let me know. And that's just like how it ended up happening. And when's the, when's the next event? Do you know yet? Yes, I sh totally should have looked this up. I'm actually going to look it up on my computer right now because I don't remember the date, but I know we decided. The date is, actually, I think it's next, yeah, that's, is that next? Yeah, that's next weekend. Um, it's Saturday, July 29th, and it is happening at uh -huh. 8 a.m. Pacific, which is a 11 a.m. Eastern. Yeah, it's next, it's next Saturday. I should have known that, but yeah, that's next Saturday, basically. Well, then I think, I think this episode won't be out by then. Oh no, <laughs> yeah. but that's okay. So if, it, if it's yeah. not, which is totally fine, it's go to iosdevhappyhour.com. That's where we will post when the meeting is, but also follow us on social media because that's actually where you would hear about it really first is following us on social media because we announce it there, but then when you sign up through the Eventbrite link that ends up adding you, adding you to like the actual email list. And then we, we send out an email when it happens every month. So in case you don't have all the social medias, like I've actually, <laughs> I've only met one person who was like, I don't own any of these social medias. And I'm like, really? <laughs> Cause I'm on social media all the time. But uh, from there, you can just put your email into Eventbrite and then we have an email list. So then you can actually get an email when the next event is though too. If you were to learn, so start learning iOS development today, how do you think you would start? Ooh, I thought about this because I did a post about this like two years ago or so. Um, it was a very clear path of what to do two years ago, I'd say. Now it's not as much because the first thing uh, somebody has to decide is should they learn Swift UI or UI kit? Uh, I have a podcast with Paul yeah. Hudson called Swift Over Coffee, and that is the latest episode is we decide which one should you learn. And the answer is not simple because everybody has very loud opinions about which one they say you should learn. But either way, though, watch or listen to that episode, plugging myself, listen to that episode to figure out what you, what you would think you should do versus like the loud opinions that everybody else has if you ask that on the internet. Um, but whichever you do, pick one of them and then learn that is what I'd say. So like, 
Paul Hudson has like awesome tutorials called 100 Days of Swift and 100 Days of Swift UI. So 100 Days of Swift is like the UI kit version and then 100 Days of Swift UI is the Swift UI version. So you can do that. Uh, that's completely free. Uh, Code with Chris has tutorials that I really like because I like video tutorials more so than like blog post kind of tutorials. So like I'll watch a video on how something works and I would say like somebody can go through that and get like the basics of how it all works. Uh, Code with Chris has a lot of paid courses as well. Sean Allen has a course. His are his intro one actually is completely free. He made that one free where it used to be paid. Uh, so like his courses, he has a YouTube ch uh, channel as well. I would say like do the, and I'm thinking like all the video courses because like I like video courses. So like, that's why I know all of those ones more so than blog posts. But I know there's um, Big Mountain Studio by Mark Moykins. He has a like whole book series for Swift UI. So like, Kind of just figure out which style would you rather learn is like should you watch a video or like read a blog post you kind of like start there and then it's just like learn how swift works and how either swift ui or ui kit works and then like once you get to a point that like you kind of understand this stuff try to make a very simple app is uh the biggest advice because it's like you're following tutorials so much it's very much like okay i can f somewhat figure out how this works following a tutorial but then trying to do it yourself is so much harder because like you you just no longer have somebody telling you exactly what to do. You have to figure out how to do that thing. So like you can even go through and like make the same app that you make in whatever tutorial series, but just doing it your, on your own and not following the series anymore. Just figuring out, okay, I made this once following the tutorial series. How would I make the same thing again, but just not following the series and trying to figure out how you did it on your own the first time because like you don't have to make some groundbreaking like crazy complicated app as your first app in fact like don't don't do that basically because it's yeah. way harder um so it's just like make something simple and just do it yourself because you'll find out like oh i learned this thing in a tutorial but i don't remember how it works so when you're making it yourself you really find which parts you actually don't know because you're trying to do it all on your own. So like you get uh, what you, you figure out what you don't know. And then like the parts that you need help with, it's you can all look, you can look them all up online. Or if you remember like what the concept or something was, you can look at it on, um, you can look at it on whatever tutorial series you were following, like get that one piece of information and then keep going with what, whatever it is that you are doing. So like, you're still trying to do it on your own, but like you, you just have help with like different parts that you need, but it's like, you're not following the cookie cutter exactly like step by step of how something works you're just trying to figure it out on your own but like that's pretty much the biggest kind of thing is like follow some tutorials but then when you somewhat feel like you kind of know th some things try to make your own app because like you'll you'll very yeah. quickly figure out what you don't know and you'll very quickly uh figure out what you want to learn basically yeah that's, that's very true <laughs> <laughs> oh, i was gonna say my first app was like a trivia app like a lot of people have made one of those yeah. so it's like yeah. You you don't have to do something super complicated. And it's on my Instagram like story highlights too of like how I made this app. I was like, okay, my first app is going to be a trivia app. Let's figure out how to do that. And like, it looks off. I mean, somewhat awful. I actually have recently taken it off the app store, but like, it looks like not great. And I didn't like know how to use UI stack views at the time. Like I actually have a screen that has three massive buttons because the UI stack view filled the screen because I didn't understand how it worked. And the, the buttons are all gigantic because they're filling the whole space. So like the button are, buttons are like 60 like points tall, like throughout the whole iPhone because I didn't know what I was doing. And I literally shipped it like that. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Nobody's even going to really download your first app anyways. So like, if it looks awful, it's okay. You just have to get it past like the app yeah. review. <laughs> That's the hard part, getting past the app review. <laughs> yeah, I my they first app it got denied sometimes. like seven times because I was trying to use a word that was copyright copyrighted and they did not oh. allow me, which makes sense. But it's I really really tried to get it through and it doesn't work, so I ended up having to like fully change the app name, like create a new project, like change the whole bundle identifier. I had to like change everything, but I tried really hard. I tried like five times uh, before I ended up finally switching something, and then it got through. <laughs> For your indie projects, how do you make the trade-offs between writing clean code and like going with design or architecture pattern and like writing unit tests or and speed? It depends on what I want out of the project. So like on my YouTube channel, I've been making an expense tracker application. And for that, I made like a full custom vapor backend and then made the front end with like uh, Swift UI. And with that, it's the back end. I wrote a couple, I think, of unit tests or wrote a couple on only the iOS side. I can't remember. Um, but it's I wrote those because I was like 
writing it all. It was all in public on stream. Like it's, I just ended that series um, on my YouTube channel. Cause I've done like 20 episodes. It's like, there's 20 different videos of me at least for like two hours building an iOS application. So 20 times two, that's already like 40 hours of video. If anybody just, you know, gets bored, um, they can go and watch that. Yeah. But it's like the kind of point that I realized the point of that series really was never to end up finishing the app. Like my YouTube channel is based off of mostly that series. Like I almost don't even have other videos on my YouTube channel. It's like pretty much all live streaming. So like with that, it's I built some U uh, unit tests and just did like MVVM. MVVM because it's one of the simpler ones to do with SwiftUI. And then I did some unit tests because I thought it would be fun to like have a video about that. So like I still haven't finished the app and I don't know when I'm going to end up finishing the app because I have, you know, a million other ideas of things I want to build. But it's like I did that because it was kind of just fueled by the live stream that I was doing. It's I'm still, yeah, never finished that app. I hope it gets finished, but I don't know if it actually end up, it will be. It might just, you know, end up being in the abandoned side project uh, graveyard. But <laughs> uh, if I was building an app that was like purely for like, I really want to finish it. It's I probably wouldn't write as many or maybe like a very specific unit test because I have been learning unit testing like relatively recently. And I think it's very interesting because I've been on a code base and like worked in a place that doesn't have any unit tests at all. And it's slightly terrifying to change anything. But if I'm the first one writing all the code, it's because I'm the one writing it. It's I at least know what's going to happen versus when you're working on something like that's code that's been written and has actually stayed there for like years and you don't like know who wrote it or like anything, that's when unit tests uh, like are better because you can't like break things as easily somewhat yeah. <laughs> it's everything can still break but hopefully it can catch something that it doesn't break as easily so like that's where i'll like put yeah. that kind of trade-off is depending on like really what the purpose is of the project it'll kind of depend on what i end up doing with it so like i currently have an app um it's funny i announced that on social media and i have not even told anybody what the app idea is at all i just put out the name um it's i'm making an app for like day one of ios 17 uh i like <laughs> I have, I literally, I bought a domain and I made a website and the prototype for this app is not even done yet. It doesn't even work. Um, so I fully did what like everybody says don't do, but I did it anyways, because I wanted to. Um, and that app, it's like, I have to get the prototype working and then I'm going to actually tell people what it is. So uh, it's in the link, probably in the description that, and I'll send it to you as well, uh, is like getfruitful.app is the URL. So like you can basically sign up to hear about the beta when I end up sending it out. So it's like the, there's a deadline in this app because my goal is day one of iOS 17. So we all know that's happening like September, October, kind of timeline so like i have a deadline but i still have to you know finish the rest of of the whole app before that happens so it's i like, probably won't be writing any unit unit test for it and i am gonna do like the simplest architecture which is probably gonna be like mvvm because it's a fully swift ui app and it's fully like ios 17 so i'm also using betas so that means that stuff is broken that shouldn't be broken and there's bugs and everything so that's partially why i haven't <laughs> finished it is that i have found one thing I'm trying to do is an iOS 17 bug. So part of it is I have to wait for them, wait for Apple to maybe fix something before I can actually even finish the app. So we'll see how this goes. It's funny because I also like told people publicly, hey, I'm building this app. So, you know, if I don't do it, like somebody will be like, hey, remember that time you talked about this app that you were building yeah. and then didn't finish it? And I'll be like, oh, yeah, I remember that time. <laughs> so it's like. It, it just depends on what the purpose is of an indie app. And then I'll kind of change what I want to do with it. Yeah. Yeah. Cause as you said, like the unit test can be super beneficial, but if you're going for speed and you just want to launch something quickly, then mm -hmm. sometimes yeah, definitely. it's like not just... the most important, but it depends on who you talk to. If you're talking to somebody who's super into yeah. TDD, which is test-driven development, which is you write the test before you even write your code, they will say it is beneficial. Yeah. But it all depends on if you're good yeah. at it too. Cause like you could write TDD kind of tests, but like if you're not really good at it yet, like it's actually, it will slow you down. Like that is, it, it just will happen. But if you are good at TDD, maybe it doesn't slow you down. And it's not like, it doesn't feel as less meaningful than it does to other people. So it all depends. Yeah, that's just uh, another one of those trade-offs that you have to decide. Yep. And that's a th another thing. If you just put that out on social media anywhere and ask people, you'll get like a million different answers. 
Like, so if you just like ask somebody what's the best code coverage, and I did this like on a poll of like starting at like 20 to going up to like 80 or something like that. And like every single option was like a different level. You'll get like a million answers. So like, let's take everything with a grain of salt, just like pick whichever way you want to do and kind of do it. Maybe somebody will give you a suggestion on a better way to do something. But like, just asking for opinions, like developers have loud opinions. So like, you're going to get a lot of answers no matter what it is. Yeah. Like programmers can't decide if yeah. you should if you should use spaces or tabs and your average person in the world doesn't even know what that means. So like, don't worry about whatever you decide. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> One question I really wanted to ask is, uh, so what, why the unicorn? Cause I, 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 I see that a lot in your branding and everywhere. Yes. It's so funny. Only a few people have ever actually even asked me. Everybody just accept, accepts. Michaela just has a profile picture. That's a unicorn. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I decided it because, uh, I think it was iOS. No, not iOS. Cause I don't remember which iOS version it was, uh, the iPhone 10 or 10 S came out and that's where they introduced the memojis and the animojis. So like, you know, it was the little like Nintendo me thing that somewhat looks like you when Apple first launched yeah. it, it was like, they didn't really have a ton of customization options. Like they were all very basic. So like if somebody set their profile picture to be a memoji, honestly, they all look the exact same because there was like, not a lot of customization. So because of that, as I was like, screw it, I'll just be a unicorn instead. And so I picked that as my profile picture. And then with that, it's, I was just like, whatever, it doesn't matter. Like, uh, it's like, nobody has their profile picture as an animal. Like I actually don't think I've seen another person that has used one of the animals as their profile picture. Everybody just uses the emojis. But with that, it's people sometimes like on social media, because they don't do any research or don't look farther, they think I'm a guy rather than a girl. So like, I will get DMs that say, hello, sir, <laughs> can you please teach me how to program? So like, people don't look far enough. So that actually kind of helps with bias. Because if it's a random person on the internet, if they're if they're talking to a guy or a girl, they will speak differently sometimes. So like, I just get DMs that say, hello, sir, can you please help me? And <laughs> immediately I know they didn't put any effort into whatever they're trying to do, because if you click on my profile picture anywhere and go actually to my profile, which is, you know, just one click farther, then you would see that it says like she, her pronouns. So like, I can immediately figure out like how hard somebody tried when they're DMing me, but it's, I just kept it as my profile picture. Cause like that anonymity, nobody knows, like, it's kind of just like, it yeah. became a thing because like people would then it's, I'm the only one with his profile picture. Like some people will have like a unicorn in like their name or something like the emoji, but nobody else has a picture. Like nobody else uses the animals as their profile picture. So like, it's easy for people to remember. So then because of that, that's why I ended up buying this hat was that like people will then associate. Cause like nobody then knows <laughs> what I look like either, which like could be a good or bad thing, yeah. <laughs> but like nobody knows who this random person is who has like a unicorn as their profile picture. So like people wouldn't know what I look like. So then when I bought this hat and I right. showed up like to an iOS dev conference, they're like, Oh, I know who you are now because I follow you on Twitter and your profile picture is a unicorn. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to ask about the hat too, because there's only a few places where you don't have the hat on. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's basically, I think it's just videos that I didn't buy it yet. Uh, there's like the vapor series that I did on code with Chris's channel. It's, I don't have this hat because I don't even have the green screen either. Um, but it's because of that. It's, I didn't have both of those at the time yet. Cause like, you know, you're always constantly building up your setup. So it's, I didn't have those at that time, but then it's ever since I did buy this hat, then it's, I've worn it for like everything else. Cause that is now it's a whole brand thing. And that's how people recognize me because I haven't changed my profile picture. It has stayed like that for the last like three or so years. And now it's almost, I can't change it. Cause then people aren't going to know who I am anymore. So it's funny that it's, yeah, I just bought this hat and then it is yeah purely, purely now just a branding thing of that's how somebody would recognize me if I say, oh yeah, this is my name. Because if you meet people at a conference and you follow them on Twitter, some people don't look like their profile picture. That is a whole thing. I have talked to somebody one time for the entire day before I realized the same person I'm talking to in person is somebody I was tweeting at back and forth, like throughout the whole conference. And it wasn't until the end of the day, he was like, oh yeah, that's me, by the way. Like we've been talking like that was me. And I was like, are you serious? We've been talking all day and I didn't know because they didn't look like their profile picture. <laughs> He was catfishing. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Thank you for coming on the show. Where can the people find you? 
I'm guessing just just look for a unicorn on social <laughs> media and you'll find her. Yes. Uh, thank you so much for having me. It's My name is Michaela Karen. Mm. So the hard part is you have to spell my name correctly to be able to find me. But yes, if you see the profile picture, that's a unicorn. That's me. But you spell my name M-I-K-A-E-L-A. And then my last name is Karen. So it's C-A-R-O-N. Uh, it's on like my name, MichaelaKaren.com. If you go to slash links, that's like the URL that has all of my social media on it because now we have, I actually have like five to seven or something, something insane. But it's, if you just remember MichaelaKaren.com slash links, that has the rest of them because some of them I have to have my full name, others I have to have like underscores and stuff in my name because somebody already has my name. So that's yeah. that's just how you can find me everywhere. Is, is if you somewhat spell it correctly and you follow other iOS devs, it's I'll end up hopefully popping up. But if you see the unicorn profile picture, then that's me. Thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of the iOS Dev Podcast. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, please make sure to subscribe, leave a review. If you're enjoying the show, make sure you check out some of the older episodes with fellow developers and consider joining Patreon to support the show.